Hello, everyone. Thank you for coming. It's great to have you in this day that the, the school is almost empty. Um, uh, we have Megan Panzano uh, today in this talk, and I just want to make a brief uh, intro, um, although you, many of you know her. Megan is a design critic in architecture at the Harvard University, graduate school of design. She currently coordinates and teaches the first uh, core uh, studio and the undergraduate programs. First core uh, studio is one of the most difficult and, and sophisticated programs we have, and it takes a lot. I'm, I'm very grateful of the work you are doing. She has received a bachelor from Yale and her master from the GSD. He graduated with ho she graduated with honors, distinction, and, and numerous prizes, including the uh, James Templeton Kelly thesis prize. Um, <clears throat> She has made a recently an exhibition in this school, Living Anatomy, that probably you remember well. Uh, in addition to teaching uh, at the school, uh, Megan practices in Boston, where she is the founder of Studio PM, a design practice invested in research and production at multiple scales. The name of the studio, I, I, I mean, last time I also talked about the name of the studio. It, it seems that it's a key part of our the young generation. Uh, and the studio itself aims to be operating on the edge, <laughs> exhibiting dual behaviors and inviting to multiple interpretations. Uh, there is a traditional reading of the studio's name, uh, PM uh, Panzano Megam, uh, but already the studio website uh, suggests some alternate uh, interpretations. A studio of polymath pursuits, a studio in search of paradoxical matter, or a studio that works late uh, in the PM, <laughs> which is, uh, this isn't very common, <laughs> the last one. Well, uh, I think that the, uh, aspire, uh, the studio aspires to define uh, itself uh, at the same time with all these uh, uh, descriptions. Uh, uh, let me just add a little bit that uh, Megan practice are, is representative of, of a larger set of younger, uh, young practitioners who are establishing edge cases for architectural uh, disciplinarity. No? Uh, these are practices which value hazy and multivalent self-definitions, the work on similarly ambiguous objects, and in similarly indeterminate situations. Uh, their instinct is to move towards aberrant issues in search of indistinct forms which maintain the potential to surprise, to evolve, or to show that they have contained more content than you had once supposed. I think that today uh, she will make a kind of demo of, of what I have, I hope that, <laughs> I have explained here in this brief introduction. Let's, let's, let's say hello to Megan. <laughs> Please come here. All for you. Um, thank you, Inyaki, for that introduction. Um, I hope to meet that bar. <laughs> um, that's the aim for today. Um, and thank, thank you all. Um, also, Inyaki, thank you for the opportunity to contribute to the Innovate Lecture Series. It's been a lot of fun to, um, to um, attend and watch past colleagues of mine make these presentations, and I'm honored to be a part of the group. Um, I want to thank all of you for coming and joining this afternoon. I know it's a very busy time of the year, but it's nice to see so many familiar faces in the room. Okay, um, today I'm going to present a completed and ongoing work produced through uh, my independent practice, Studio PM, which I began in 2013, three years ago. I've curated three projects with one short cameo appearance of another that explore a topic of perpetual interest to me, and I think you can find echoes of this um, across my expanded set of past and present architectural work, um, The Edge. I've selected this talk title for a few reasons. First, I'm framing The Edge um, as a conceptual seat that enables control over contingencies, which I'm defining as conditional occurrences that carry a degree of instability with them. I imagine this as occupying the line between things, a series of if then subject to variable pressures with time as a dominant factor. Second, the contingencies specific to each project that I'm going to present are rescued from what may be considered the periphery of architecture, an edge of another sort, and are centralized in each project as a primary architectural engine. 
Each tests the generative capacity of this newly essential variable. Lastly, all the projects that you'll see today hail from the edge, occupying as yet undefined space at the margins. And all should be seen as experiments in bringing some edge to the edge and establishing spatial identity where it is not yet found. My approach to designing in this way, incorporating the uncertainty of the real, draws vitality from the work of a pair of contemporary artists, Barry Lava, whose work explores the intersection of um, outcomes or inconsistent outcomes at the intersection of action and material, as is in the case in this project, Cleavered Wall and Disentangle, and Mark Dion, whose very artistic medium is unpredictable found material mined from institutional archives or coastal archaeological digs, as is in the case in this project off the coast of Maine. He takes these objects and imbues them with new value based on associations within the space of a collected and displayed set. And I'm arguing that both, both artists deal in time, the uh, process-based work of Lava and the durations of um, expeditional digging for Dion, um, and also both operate at the edge of control. The first of my projects that extends these concepts into built form is a completed exhibition on the Kumela. The show is a globe-trotting space invader that has been traveling internationally to 10 different sites since its opening here at Harvard this time last year. US locations, in addition to a few um, already under its belt here in Boston, include um, New York and San Francisco, with global spots um, Delhi, Mumbai, Basel, Switzerland, where it's currently installed. And it'll be back here at the MFA in May and move on to Santiago, Chile later this year. The very great team at the Harvard South Asia Institute hired me to design the exhibit to cohere content collected by various schools um, documenting the event of the Kumbh Mela, a Hindu pilgrimage that occurs once every 12 years in Allahabad, India, at the confluence of the Ganges and Yamuna rivers. Bathing in the sacred river at this time is believed to cleanse one of all sins, so there's an enormous impetus to attend, and the event draws up to 70 million people over three sacred months generating an enormous temporary city to house and serve these crowds. Every 12 years, the alluvial plain left behind changes and new ground appears as host to successive events. And this necessitates an adaptable planning grid for the development of each successive pop-up megacity. The flexible grid was extended into my work on the exhibition as a tool for designing through reconfiguration, anticipating an array of host sites that would vary radically in size, axiality, and circulatory lighting and structural conditions. Through three host sites known at the outset, as you can see diagrammed in the series of, um, of plans at right, a large, a medium, and a small, Boston, Chile, and Basel respectively, we developed a base and fixed set of panel dimensions that would invade these spaces in interesting ways, slipping within and nesting new space into existing architectural containers. 32 self-structural panels of three different widths are all seven feet high, large enough to make their own space but not entirely vanquish their hosts. These panels cross-register research on the Kumela by topics organized into four arms. And this is one version of the large instantiation that was actually installed on Harvard's campus um, in April of last year. These four arms are linked at a central space, an aquatic atmosphere, which is animated by water. Two videos of the bathing ritual with sound were both front and rear projected onto the panels of the exhibition. And immersive imagery um, populated this space as well, scaled to such a size that it was intended to draw the viewer into the event. The four topic arms can spatially reconfigure, combine, and extend, as, in, as is the case in this medium format example, or atrophy to a set of core panels around the aqua atmosphere as site extremes necessitate. And all of the content of the show is laid out um, on panels with a system of very consistent datums to enable all of this um, um, sort of variable configuration as need be. The show's international itinerary is also um, enabled through material specificity. All of its space is created through lightweight printed scrim screen panels affixed like stretch canvases to hollow light gauge anodized aluminum frames that can conceal LED lighting within for self-illumination. Every component disassembles and flat packs into crates sized for shipping efficiency. 
After a series of prototypes, the two fabrics were selected for their ephemeral light-emitting qualities, but also for their precision and durability to withstand iterative install and deinstall processes. The entire exhibit can be deployed and install completed by a crew of two in as little as two hours, which several um, event deadlines have necessitated already. This is one example of our prototyping, I think our third round, um, from unpacking materials to setting up a panel. The panel size allows for slippage around and through existing spaces. Their particular transparency enables them to be conditioned by variations in each environment creating rooms within rooms and passages within passages. The slippage of exhibit space and site produces each time something new as these two variables work in contingent concert. The exhibit is as much about iteratively redefining the narrative of its own content in relation to each site as it is a series of experiments in redefining each containing space, recoding existing patterns of use and experience through its temporal presence. And you can see the aluminum frame carcass of sorts at uh, disassembly here, ready to flat pack into its crate and freight away. So I'm going to now land us in a very different project uh, whose construction is imminent, called the Stowaway House. Um, and this time in a fixed location. The project is located at the southernmost point of New Jersey, very near the shore, but not the Jersey Shore that you all might be thinking of, popularized by our very good friend Snooky and company. Um, rather, this, <laughs> a town brimming with early Victorian and Craftsman era buildings, the West Cape May Historic District. Um, a national historic landmark is one of the nation's earliest resort towns. As such, uh, the project that I'm working on was required to smoothly syncopate with its context, a stealthy gable with a twist, but conceals a more dynamic, hyper-articulated interior, and these three images allow a kind of peek into its peak. Um, this dualism of a smooth exterior with a differentiated interior foregrounds other dualities that play out in the design. So the site is um, just blocks from the beach, and my project actually replaces an existing carriage house um, on the property that has seen better days. Its design addresses a pair of dueling needs and occupancies. Seasonally, it must toggle between serving as a souped up guest suite and also providing storage space for beach gear for owners of the main house. So this small space that you see in gray must swerve between identities of autonomy and appendage. Um, the two sets of dueling occupants um, that would share this interior are here measured in scale with each other the array of vacation gear, and the four guests that would co-occupy the space. The gable roof is pulled in the diagonal along its ridge to produce twin peaks that legislate exposure to neighbors on two opposing edges, the main house at the northwest, the kind of upper left right here, um, and an adjacent guest house of the neighboring property at the southeast corner down here. The lower portion, which you see here cut in plan, is thick enclosed with surfaces of variable depth, containing space for both gear and guests. With wall tapering calibrated to a precise but odd beach mat storage meets sitting bench dimension at its narrowest edge here, for example, and deepening to um, an equally precise but strange surfboard closet meets, meets kitchenette counter depth at the opposite end here. Tall points on each peak land midway over a private sleeping loft. Here's one of those peaks and the other. <clears throat> um, and these lofts are um, sort of retreating under the geometry of the roof line to avoid exposure to those two neighboring properties. Adjacent to these private sleeping lofts, a skylight um, slots in volumes of natural light adjacent, which illuminate the sectional depth of the house. The cyclic presence and absence of gear is celebrated in the lower portion. This flux projected in the, into the interior through um, lockable cabinet doors of translucent white tempered glass. The space is stripped of its conventional cues of use and something else is layered. The legibility of the animate and animate introduces temporal variation into the interior that it would not otherwise have. In contrast, 
the pair of upper sleeping lofts are contained within a thin exterior, uh, producing a pair of spaces of escape for um, lounging by day or stargazing by night. These dualisms play out within a singular interior volume, bound by standard 16-inch on center spaced wood frame structural bands. Um, each of these express continuity from the tapered, thinner rafter at roof down to the thickened super stud containing space below. The goal being that um, when you're within one, you can never fully evade the other condition. There's a kind of um, equal presence of the thick within the thin and vice versa. In this way, the hope is that the wood frame becomes a stable foil for some of the instabilities playing out inside. Um, and this model depicts the singular void of the interior, the subject slash object space, constrained by the regular rhythm of the um, framing bands, the structural bands, which you see here in negative relief. And I think of this as a kind of structural Spanx model of sorts, constraining this burgeoning interior. Um, the larger site for this project is typified by properties with similarly coupled main and auxiliary structures. Um, you can see that the secondary structures that dot those lots are highlight here in this larger, um, larger site plan. And my work um, in West Cape May is occurring during a time when guest rental demand is just exceeding supply. So um, this is also my plan to expand my own temporal engagement with the beach and um, hopefully work on a series of projects like this. Um, in addition to pointing forward, this project also points back and extends into built form research trajectories I began here in my design thesis of 2010, a project um, entitled A Living Archive, in which I was working on the development of a new type, a part house, part museum, part storage, um, that investigated the architectural implications of reappropriating archiving as a personal enterprise. In this project, I was working on um, exploring a design um, that would enable ambiguities of surface and space and inside and out to, um, to play out through the adaptation of Klein bottle geometry as the kind of geometry of the base unit, um, in which containment would be negotiated through a toggled reading of surface and depth and concealment and reveal. In the project, the single surface of the form was thickened and thinned at varying rates to house both object and subject simultaneously. And you can see here a kind of composite multi-view drawing, three plan drawings of the unit that I developed um, with unfolded interior elevations adjacent and calibrated to the spaces in the plan with a scaled up section um, combined in one, in one drawing. Circulation through the interior would reveal boundaries and thresholds that were continuously unfolding negotiating for primacy with the spaces that they enclose. So these views would be equally animated by one circulation through the interior as they would be through the cycles of accumulation and dissipation of objects that would be encrypted on their thickened surfaces. Um, these original bas-relief drawings, in addition to two others as part of the full set, along with uh, representations of the beach house, are both currently on display in Loeb Library and the Interior Matters exhibition. So you guys should check them out. I, like them, I'm happier with them in their physical, real form than I am in their projected secondary presence here, so take a look. Um, lastly, this current and in-process project for Save That Stuff negotiates um, cycles of accumulated matter with the volume turned up just slightly. Save That Stuff is located along the industrial waterfront in nearby Charlestown, Massachusetts, and they're a wonderful, incredible, uh, independently owned company, um, a major materials recycling facility um, here in the Boston area, located specifically just at the base of the Tobin Bridge South, with a 60,000 square foot plant on just over four acres of land. And here they process and prepare 250 tons of recyclable material per day through a system of sifting and baling that turns out textures like this constantly, a kind of defamiliarization of the familiar that I'm always seduced by. This processing um, requires over 100 trucks deliver and pick up on their site daily. Um, and this incessant trafficking of trucks and stuff uh, results in this, which I affectionately call a cluster truck, um, which is a byproduct of two things. First, um, they're a great success. They have a lot of clients right now, which is a wonderful thing. 
um, but also a byproduct of the odd geometry and disconnection on their existing site. So this is an existing site plan. Um, you can see the, the kind of wedge shape at bottom here, um, which is called the front yard, disconnected from the rest of the property um, at top by the main plant building through which um, trucks must actually circulate um, to connect these two spaces. So in order to resolve the cluster truck patterns on a site so intensely charged with um, varying uh, uh, quantities of moving matter, um, existing corridor and boundary conditions were measured and assessed to prioritize vehicular flow on site and develop a site design plan that would enable the company to grow in three phases, lining these truck paths. The first, um, at the southernmost point, um, sort of infiltrating that wedge space of the front yard, an outdoor meeting um, event space, an event space for the company. The second, um, a new scale manager's office just inside the wall of the main scale, the main uh, plant building. And the third, a pair of um, new buildings in the rear yard, a new organics, and a new single stream recycling center. And we'll be tackling the design and construction of these in sequence over the next few years. This, along with the ambition to cohere the fragmented halves of the site to one another and through these new architectural additions. We developed um, a super graphic of wayfinding striping in two hues and rhythms, one for people, the more densified pattern that you see at bottom, and one for trucks, the more attenuated pattern. Um, and the thought is that the architectural pieces would become a kind of built volumetric extension of these two patterns. Influenced by the linear textural, textural array of baled matter flowing through this space constantly and mining corollaries in various existing industrial materials on site, the project has evolved into a study in oscillating registrations of a striated field, toggled readings between 2D surface and 3D volume. The goal being, at times, logic of log logics of interiority and exteriority and the indices that distinguish horizontal from vertical planes are erased, and a closed flatness is registered, as is the case in the two images at left. And at other times, these same fields reveal the array of spatial volumes they contain, as seen in the image at right. We're aspiring to retain a seemingly seamless um, perception of the striated banding in either of these two instances. And you can see the fold lines of that continuous surface added to these diagrams here. These, at times, oscillations between surface and volume are currently being explored through a choreographed series of vantage points as one arrives on site and traverses from front to rear yard via this system of wayfinding striping, which we plan to paint on the ground in traction epoxy impreg impregnated asphalt paint. Um, and you can see that this series depicts that route and the kind of um, the choreography of the relationship of these um, striated surfaces from entry gate through front yard, through plant building, and rear yard in 11 moments in time. I'm also working through um, snapping materials and seams of the architectural projects to align with these painted super stripes and extend the striated field into the third dimension. Equally interested in the capacity of a single striated surface to flicker between readings of flat and volumetric. And this is a diagrammatic study of the rear wall of the scale manager's office, which we're calling the Baylor wall, um, to be composed of two layers of translucent polycarbonate with the grain um, oriented vertically. That would contain within it end cuts of baled material, in this case, print matter that could flicker and reflect light in different ways as traffic movement behind it would vary lighting conditions that would be allowed to, um, to uh, filter through. This summer, we'll be tackling the first of these, the site striping, um, and the first of the architectural projects. Um, for this first um, out outdoor parklet for staff and events, we'll be tapping into um, a kind of uh, readily available resource, uh, a accumulation in excess of wood shipping pallets on site, which we plan to take apart and um, organize into a series of design platforms that, like tangrams, can be easily reconfigured to enable a variety of events on site. And this is an example of the kind of everyday linear arrangement, um, which would enable impromptu meeting and lunch break space. Um, these platforms could be remixed to host company and community events, 
Um, Save That Stuff collaborates with a bunch of um, community initiatives, and they throw really great parties. So we needed something to formalize this and um, ensure its endurance on site. Um, or these platforms could be broken down further to provide much needed privacy islands for staff on site. Important to me as I work through this um, is the intentional reorientation of decking grain on parts of the platform. So even when the geometry aligns, these misalignments in pattern always overtly point to other possibilities. A tracery of something else is always present. Um, a point to contingencies or the specific conditional occurrences that would activate change over time. And that is what I have on the edge. Jennifer and, and John Lott with, with Sophia Walter and James uh, Justin and Justin. So <laughs> can you go to the table and uh, it's very easy. Yeah. Thank you for coming. And <clears throat> as you all know, I mean the idea is that uh, some students of the school and some instructors respond to the presentation and then we open a little bit to the public in some minutes, okay? So, you stay here. Oh, I got it. Yeah. Yeah. I'm here. <laughs> you suffer here. That's fine. So please, who wants to be the first? Then? Yeah, sure, I'll go. I have a, uh, Megan, thank you for that presentation. It's really great to see the work uh, together, seeing it uh, separately before. Uh, my question for you, actually I was reminded of, well, my question is about time, the temporal, aspect of your work relative to what you're calling the edge, and also about the spatial properties of what you claim to be an edge, and the question about how thick or thin the edge really is. I like is, this question. And <laughs> how much you need to rely on uh, a short amount of time or a, a, dur a long duration of time uh, relative to thickness and thinness in, in each case. Yeah. Um, OK. That's a, that's a really good question. I think um, my interest in this, um, obviously, well, um, I'm, all of these projects deal with kind of um, interrogating architecture and its objecthood. Um, they look at ways to um, fold in pressures from a larger field, um, sort of as a means of getting architecture out of the kind of status as a static, um, fixed, frozen entity, let's say. Um, and I think that that brings time into it when um, I am trying to always sort of, through that enterprise, find ways to register that um, in real materials of architecture. And it gets into the concept of medium specificity. So exactly what um, constituent elements might we claim as being ours to work with in um, a given art form, in this case, in architecture. It's a Clement Greenberg term from the 1950s. but. Um, you know, an argument can be made that a certain limited set of constituent elements have been played out and have, we've exhausted what they can provide to us and that we're in a time now of kind of post-medium um, having to deal with, grapple with a kind of definition of an expanded set of constituent elements. Um, I would add time to that expanded set and this has been taken up um, in recently by Sylvia Levin, who talks about a kind of super medium as being an answer to a kind of post medium specificity um, in which um, she defines a, a super medium as incorporating the kind of component of time. In her case, she thinks about it uh, through um, finding avenues to incorporate digital technology or um, digital projection into architecture and thereby um, engage time, surfaces thickened with time through that element in the mix. Um, in all of these projects, I'm taking that up, I think, the idea of a super medium and riffing on it with time as a central element. Um, uh, I can use, I think it may be more obvious how it is working in the later two projects, maybe. Um, in the exhibition, um, time is a, a, you know, I'm thinking about thickening surfaces <laughs> um, is a really important part of that project. So when my work designing the exhibit ended um, and it was up and installed, that was really the beginning of the project for me. So in no way do I think the medium 
of architecture stops at the thinness of any of those panels, the screens stretched over the frames. It's actually through the panel, um, through the space of every containing space that that exhibit sort of lands in, all the way to the edges of those containing spaces. Um, and that has a time component within it um, because those sites change constantly. Um, all of the kind of variables that come with that is what I, that's, that's a thickened medium this kind of my version of a super medium with a new animated agent that has sight to do with it, but also time to do with it in the mix. Um, that is like a two year duration to answer your question about duration of time. Um, so the project is like a two year project. That's where it's at for me is the, is the interaction of the exhibition with those host sites um, and all the variation that comes with that. Um, in the others, I think it's a seasonal cycle, let's say in the beach house. So it's a kind of, you know, a couple cycles of time throughout the year that may change one's experience in that space. Um, in the way that I'm thinking about um, the recycling center working, it's a kind of duration of time that moves from um, entry to, to rear of the space. And the series of almost anamorphic perspectives that would reorient your relationship to the striated fields that are a part of that project. So. Um, that's my answer to the different durations, but time is a, is definitely a part of it all. Yeah, we'll get we'll get into it more. <laughs> okay, so um, Megan, I was trying to like come up with a question because you know you're a respondent and you're sitting on the front row, and I found myself kind of moving all over my page. So this might sound a little messy, but I wanted to kind of make a reading of. Uh, what I saw and some things that I didn't see, but I know that are in your work that you're doing in your practice. So um, when I was thinking about this morning prior to walking in this room um, about the work you're taking on at Studio PM, uh, I'm reminded of a quote that uh, Pedro Gondano, at the former curator at the MoMA, said when he first kind of came into office in 2012, when he said, curating is the new criticism. And um, I mean, he left, I think, MoMA last year. But I do want to uh, <laughs> pause on that for a moment Absence. because um, it seems like there's a group of architects who are curating other work, other people's work, or other material, or other disciplines. In the case of that first exhibit that you showed, mm -hmm. and I'm thinking about Andrew Holder's uh, work at Michigan, where he was tasked with kind of curating a rare books thing. So these are. And it just seems like there's a collection of people uh, working on this. Um, and I think what you have to do when tasked with these things is you have to make a critical reading of content. But then I believe you're also working through architectural problems right. at the same time. Yeah. Um, and so you're sifting through content. You're sifting through the flexible in that first exhibit, you're the super thin wall. Um, and yeah, if you could just talk on any of these themes and if you think that there's relevancy to this because you didn't spend a lot of time talking about your thesis, but we know archiving, curating, collecting is something you're kind of obsessed with. Yeah. Uh, I'm a I'm a meta collector, right? I collect collecting. <laughs> That's definitely the case. Um, I, I, have, I have a lot of experience doing exhibition design, which always um, brings in even from the design standpoint, I think it brings in curation. There, you can't avoid it and have co-curated shows as well. So um, that's a part of all this. I think um, I think it's a kind of narrative, <laughs> um, or at least producing a kind of experience. And I'm trying to play that out spatially through architectural means in these projects. But I think I'm trying to draw threads from, from my own obsession with kind of collection and curation um, now through these projects. I think also there's a certain, these aren't, when I'm when I'm dealing with contingencies, it's not an open and it's not an infinite open-ended system. I mean, I'm, in all these cases, it requires curation, deciding how you're bracketing the variables at play and the kind of animated agent that I'm working with in each of these, um, and finding a way for those to um, uh, register architecturally. And in, in in my case, that's also a choice of kind of where your authorship lies when you're dealing with things that are slightly out of your control. Um, so it's a, it's a kind of curation of what you're bringing in, but also how you're dealing with it that is definitely a part of all, all of this work. Um, in my case, with the dynamic agents here, I'm making a very conscious choice not to have a kind of 
or not to explore a kind of formal um, uh, allusion to, f to the dynamism in some way, or to have these projects like kinetically transformer in front of you as a way of addressing those variables. But um, what I find interesting about working with the instabilities of the specific set of contingencies that I've curated, so to speak, in each of these, is that through the instability in each project, I'm developing a kind of stable component that becomes an element that helps to both control that that animated agent, but also find a kind of traction in architecture. Like it develops a very specific architectural language in each project. Um, the panel size and the translucency of the fabric, you know, is an example in the exhibit. Um, I'd say the regular rhythm of uh, the structural wood frame and the beach house, um, though its depth varies, you know, that's something that becomes almost a metric of being able to measure that variability against. Yeah. Thank you so much. It was great to see you present. Um, I think that one thing in your work that I've seen over the past few years is also an interest in the poche. And when you present this as the edge, I think of the poche as sort of an edge, but it, in these series of projects, they have a sightedness to them. So I was wondering if you could talk more about that sightedness from the aspect of the exhibition that seems to definitely have a back side to it, or the house, which has this familiar outside, but then a different interior. Yeah, I think um, I didn't make clear, but the exhibition can also, um, it can exhibit content on both sides in anticipation of also being a kind of um, uh, manager of space, the remnant space that surrounds the exhibition, not just what happens within, but without as well. Um, so that is a kind of dual-sided scenario. I also, I mean, I think um, it gets back to thickness, that you know, the thinness of a screen, in the case of the exhibition, um, its particular translucency was really important because it always, it, it always then brought in these um, kind of temporal other conditions. You know, the aspects of those panels would be high lit by um, elements in the environment where it was um, exhibited and that varies based on those different host sites. So that was really important to have that kind of aspect um, be a part of it. I think in the case of the um, beach house, it's a, an interest I've, I've always had in this kind of surprise factor or the maybe being a little bit more nuanced with how you encounter um, these more um, variable or unstable elements in these projects that what you see is not what you get. I mean, from the outside, it looks pretty smooth. That's my students are going, oh, now we know why we hear that all the time when she's dealing with hidden room, but um, or why I say that that will echo beyond. But I, um, you know, I think that there's a kind of more nuanced way to, to um, encounter the, the kind of strange hybridities that some of these projects are, are bringing up. Um, and I, I've always liked that kind of reveal or the hook. You know, I'm looking for the hook, a way to draw people through. Thanks. Is this on? Yeah. Um, yeah, so my, uh, for everyone that doesn't know, I uh, took Megan's uh, studio first year when I was here, and I've also TA'd for her. So my, when I'm looking at this project, it's always tinted by the sort of my understanding of you as an instructor. So my question Sorry. is... Sorry. <laughs> no, it's great. But that's why I'm just prefacing that because my question is sort of about pedagogy, I guess. The, um, and the way, I mean, contingency in the edge, to me, it's always about sort of like an uncertainty of like always oscillating between um, what's on one side of the edge and the other, between two states or multiple states. And I just wonder if that you think that's at odds with the first year studio and the undergrad studio in the sense of being fundamental, like they have to be fundamental studios. So how do you, how does that translate to pedagogy? The the idea of fundamentals as being something that is foundational and not an edge in some sense, or is is it always an edge? That's a really good question. I'm not sure I'm going to have an answer off the cuff for you on that today. But um, you know, I think that I think a lot of the, I mean, I just brought up kind of concepts that we talk about through Hidden Room, you know, in reference to one of these projects. I think those concepts are still, um, I'm still grappling with them, even from my time as a student here now, like six years. That's getting pretty long. But um, uh, so I think, I think they really do, I, I firmly believe that um, the types of projects that we run, say, in first semester, they may not um, uh, sort of at present enable the same type of experimentation with 
kind of edge in the literal sense that you know I'm exploring in, in these projects and also others that I didn't present today because of privacy issues and the status of where they were. But um, uh, I do think the concepts speak, um, speak and sort of echo far longer. They cast a much longer shadow. Um, and I'm, I'm, there are things I'm still thinking about, you know, in, the, in this work, definitely. Um, yeah, that's a good one. That's, that's good. That's good job, Justin. You taught I'll, me well. <laughs> I'm going to chew on that one. And we'll, I see you all the time. Very fortunate. So we'll, we'll talk about that one more. Yeah, I guess I'll go back to um, a little bit about the curatorial aspect of the work and, and in a sense back to this uh, aspect of time and what needs to change, I guess, in each case for you. There's an aspect of change in each project, whether it's content or even movement across uh, around surfaces or elements that give you a kind of perception of 2D versus 3D uh, or that the content itself changes, the storage. Right? And so is it okay for you that... Um, there are multiple factors that change when you're dealing with uh, setting up certain stable conditions for the variable, variable that, you, that you talk about to be more active. Can it be the user and the content and right on and on and on? Or is it certain things that, that you're in control of the change? I, I'm aspiring to the latter, that there are certain things that I'm in control of in these projects. I think if anything goes, it becomes a kind of indeterminate soup of sorts. But I, um, you know, in my process, my working with these um, sort of animated or in, uh, the instabilities of these contingent agents that I framed in the work, um, uh, what I do with that is I really draw from a kind of close reading of what that change is like. The um, the development of a kind of stable component that I think is responsive to it and is a kind of, um, you know, that's where the kind of super medium uh, discussion comes in again because it isn't that the architecture becomes this kind of neutral backdrop where all that variation in, can play out. You know, it's not, um, it, it, it's something that actually I think th um, in the way that I work with it at least, uh, analyzing what it is that's the variable um, I, r I really do um, work hard to develop a kind of architectural element that is a hybrid of those things, a kind of maybe more normative constituent, ele constituent element that we see all the time, like you know wood, wood framing. It's not anything new. But the way that the depth of those frames work in kind of sequence with each other, their depth being very precise to house another kind of variable agent. I think there's a certain anticipation or hybridity or merger of these things, the animated with the inanimate, that I'm hoping to, um, to register and give architectural traction to through the development of that component. Um, so. <laughs> yes, yes. Give me ideas. Thank you so much for sharing with us, Megan. Uh, and I want to use the microphone. And I want uh, to continue this discussion uh, that you brought up with post medium uh, and ask a question related to your use of oblique perspective. Mm -hmm. um, because I will admit I, I am not convinced yet that uh, animate. Um, and kind of indeterminacy uh, is, carries enough information to generate a new kind of specificity. And I wonder if you can connect this idea uh, of the, the things that you're adding to, the, to what we typically consider the agency of architects um, to your very precise use of oblique perspectives in drawing. Well, I don't know if I can address it through oblique perspective per se. I think um, the last project um, my work at Save That Stuff is a kind of choreography of perspective, obviously, where you're first encountering a kind of flatness, and then it reveals a third dimension, a kind of a volumetric dimension as you move through that, so your perspective changes. Um, I do think, in response to the first part of your question, um, what I'm getting into, kind of my riff on super medium, Levin's idea of super medium, I, I blew right through also um, medium specificity, 
um, post medium. Um, so you guys should research that. I, I mean, it, there's a lot written on it, but in the interest of time, I'm really kind of um, going quickly through it. Um, you know, what I was just mentioning to to John about developing a component that actually carries with it a kind of hybridity where it may be somewhat familiar, somewhat recognizable, but is adapted by the presence of this kind of new animated agent. That's my means towards um, addressing that, your, your concern or your critique of not carrying enough information in these kind of animate variables to, um, to induce change. I, I'm working on that as a kind of architectural project. <clears throat> Megan, I want to also say thank you. Uh, it's always illuminating to hear you speak. Um, and I just wanted to encourage you to make good on the phrase you've used several times today, which is traction, which I think is terribly important to your thesis. And you know, from the small part describing this kind of grit impregnated paint to create stripes. So the idea of gaining traction in your project uh, at the same time describing the geometry in it is, is fascinating. But also toward the um, the thesis of edge, and this goes back to John Lott's comment about a time basis, because you know over time edges lose their edge. That, that's the, the the registration of them, and I, I would encourage you to look at um, you know treatises on um, sciology or you know knife sharpening, because the hy hybrid condition you're talking about is precisely when uh, the configuration, the geometry of the edge comes into contact with a an aberrant. Yeah, there you are. I'm sorry, I missed the sorry. beginning of your talk. I'm, I'm illustrating as you're yeah. talking. Yeah. Um, it comes into contact with a, a, a particular, um, say, a whetstone or, or a strop, which kind of creates a condition for the edge, as it were. And that, to me, is a terribly interesting premise that's coming out through your work. Yeah, yeah thank you. I, I could I, I could go. We could. Oh no! I mean, keep going. <laughs> the edge can be a favorable margin. Discuss. No, I'm I'm tossing it back. Yeah, I, I, I just want you to elaborate a little bit on, on what Justin has began to yeah. to say and we are discussing in relationship with how much of your own agenda can be uh, incorporated in, in the program in such a difficult um, program as, as the first core. Okay. How do you think uh, there is a kind of way to enclose the relationship among your work and, and, and what you teach? <laughs> That's tough. I mean, I, that's tough. That's tough because I, um, I'm committed to what those projects offer. I mean, I really do think uh, there's a timelessness to them. That I mean, I, again, I don't, I don't see what I'm working on now. And this is Laval's work, but well, um, I don't see what I'm working on now as a kind of um, de uh, um, a departure away from those things. It's folding in other things. I think. Um, um, I think it's it's thinking of uh, maybe expanding one's definition of kind of um, uh, mm, that's really hard for me to answer on the spot. I'll think about it. <laughs> I need to chew on it. Yeah, I'm gonna escape that one. Oh, it, time's John up. Lott's gonna no. answer instead. <laughs> no, John Lott's gonna answer instead. Well, yeah, John. What do you think, John? I heard time was up. <laughs> I mean, I'd love to. I'd love to inject some of this into, I mean, I'm, I'm really committed to, to these ideas. So um, finding a way would be, would be, yeah, that'll be, now that this is over, that's my project right now. No, but I, I think it's a wonderful uh, point. And because you have a clear agenda, you have like uh, ways to uh, represent, to, uh, to talk about many issues, like matter, it's, Type, uh, well, the et cetera, et cetera. And, and these things are still. Uh, we still have a kind of of, of uh, mm. protection of the individuality of each, uh, against the individuality of each instructor. That that I think that is comprehensible. I mean, I, I'm part of the system and, and I'm part of, of the, the, the 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 responsibles of this this kind of behavior. But at the same time, I'm. Uh, discussing with you right. and with other coordinators, how how can we 
go beyond what we have now. No? And, and I, I don't want you to respond now because it's a very difficult issue. But, but um, I think it's a, also a wonderful topic to, to discuss. Else. Well, I definitely think, I mean, I'm looking forward to having conversations with the first semester core faculty about what we can do to um, uh, uh, sort of enliven the first semester core with our own agendas. I suppose that process in and of itself folds in time, right? <laughs> Um, and uh, a kind of animation, we'll have to talk through that and work that out. But, um, you know, I think you mentioned something just now, the kind of means of representation, too, that I'm working through. That's a challenge with these types of projects. I mean, and one that I'm, I do battle with all the time, this idea of how to even represent. I mean, I have clients. I have, um, it, it's, it's really difficult to represent all of the multiples and the kind of variation that I, I, um, the animation of these projects in a way that, that makes sense and gives them a kind of architectural definition so people can understand them even when they're in process. So I did, I mean, I'm working through seriality all the time or I'm working through um, animated, like I did kind of analog uh, movies for you all today, but it's a, it's a challenge in and of itself how to represent some of, some of these aspects. Great. We, could find, we could find room for that. Okay, fine. Um, um, <clears throat> well, I just want to say thank you to everyone, uh, all of you in the table uh, asking questions, uh, obviously Megan and all of you having been here. We haven't finished still the Innovate Talks, even if it's, uh, we are in April, we have another one by, by Shanin Li, uh, the, talking about a new generation of Chinese architects that are I would say, uh, running out of the box and, and, and making like surprising things that you will enjoy a lot. And with this, we will be finished. But, but I want to say that this term has been especially attractive for me because we had the opportunity to hear a lot of the youngest voices that we have in the department and enjoy wonderful lectures by Andrew, John, Jennifer, Megan, also Sergio Lopez was here with a wonderful lecture. And, and it's one of the main purposes of these Innovate Talks, Lance, Lance Talks, is, is precisely to give the voice and to sh so give them the opportunity, but give us the opportunity to really understand what they are doing and, and to be able to, to, to close the relationship among what we teach and what we do, which is very important. So thank you, everyone. Thanks. Thank you.